Well, good afternoon. Uh, let me start out by saying that it's a uh, pleasure to be here today, and uh, I also thank Mark Zoback for setting it up, uh, teeing up the talk that I want to give to you very well in terms of uh, uh, the focus. I really would like to speak to you a little bit about the economic comparisons of natural gas versus solar PV. Um, this is uh, sort of perhaps as a backdrop to why I picked that particular comparison. Um, I think uh, at least everybody in this room agrees that the transition to a low carbon economy is something that the world's economies need to do pretty soon. Uh, we also all know that there is no consensus yet. Uh, the word hoax still is circulating around in the halls of Washington and, uh, today. Um, but uh, the electricity sector obviously is destined to play a crucial role in this. And uh, I picked natural gas here because we read about it, a lot about it, and we know that natural gas is probably uh, the heir apparent to coal uh, in the foreseeable future among fossil fuels. And at the same time, there's of course a lot of interest and a lot of movement in so solar photovoltaics, uh, an area that, uh, again, in particular from the policy domain and he here in our backyard in Silicon Valley, uh, is playing a, a major role. So I think medium term, um, natural gas is uh, destined to play a critical role in terms of reducing and limiting our carbon footprint and longer term, uh, that role hopefully will fall to solar. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how I see that race shaping up in the years and decades to come. Um, I also want to make the point that when we talk about competitiveness of these two sources, the thing to keep in mind is there are the economic fundamentals that are changing, and at the same time there is public policy. And the interface of these economic fundamentals and public policy, in my mind, is what makes this sort of a hard race to predict at this stage, but I'll give you sort of my take on it in terms of where we are today. Um, so let me start with the uh, uh, natural gas part. Where are we on this today? Uh, and again, part of this was already mentioned in the earlier talks. Uh, when it comes to electricity production, we have about 40% um, coal, 31% natural gas at the moment. In terms of technology, things look relatively stable for things like natural gas combined cycle plants, which is arguably economically the most attractive technology in this area. Um, and looking forward now, the share of natural gas in electricity production is poised to increase, I think, under two uh, conditions. One, which we just heard about, uh, the continual expansion of shale gas in the United States, if that revolution really materializes. And the second thing, more in the uh, policy domain, the role of the Environmental Protection Agency in not granting new licenses to coal-fired power plants. If that trend continues, then I think uh, natural gas is very much poised to play an important role uh, in the electricity generation in the short-term future. Let me play this over for a moment to what I believe characterizes the uh, solar PV industry at this moment. And there it's really a tale of, in my mind, uh, two separate industries almost. If you look at it from the perspective of developers, um, it looks pretty good at the moment. Growth rates are high. Um, I start there with the number, while, ele while solar PV still only accounts for about 3% of all electricity generation in the US. Um, the numbers over the last couple of years are pretty impressive. Uh, in the year 2010, you see we had a total of 17 gigawatt, this is worldwide, uh, installed in, in new solar power installations. That number was significant in so far as it was equal to the total that had been installed in the entire history of uh, this industry over the last uh, 30 so years. And ever since, that is since 2010, we have seen still continual rapid growth rates so that at, not, at this point we're just reaching about the 100 gigawatt capacity level worldwide in terms of total installations that the world has. Still, this is a small slice, but the, the growth has been pretty impressive. 
Uh, and we see companies like Solar City and other solar developers still coming into this space and being able to make money in this area too, which uh, in terms of, again, the predictions how these industries shake up in my mind is important to keep in mind. Now, if you go back one level sort of to the upstream level, that is the manufacturers, um, it looks a little different. Uh, solar panels, the prices of solar panels have come down very, very rapidly over the last couple of years. You see there the 40% drop in 2011 alone. Part of that was a consequence of new entry into the industry, largely from Chinese manufacturers. And of course, these falling panel prices in turn have spurred uh, the deployment and the activity that I mentioned in the downstream uh, area a moment ago. Um, if you look at the financials of any of these players in, uh, that make solar cells today, it doesn't look pretty. By any measure, they're losing a lot of money, but they're also staying in the industry at this point and keep uh, producing. So there's somewhat of a split picture here in terms of where this industry stands, and I think that makes it particularly important to try a prediction uh, as to where we're going from here. A, a couple of facts to keep in mind in terms of um, public policy. Uh, at the moment, the U.S. has considerable uh, public subsidies, tax subsidies, that are advancing uh, the deployment of solar. And I mentioned in particular a 30% investment tax credit, and then there are also ways to write off these types of investments uh, faster than normal investments can be. And then in certain states, and particularly here in California, the thing to also keep in mind are the renewable portfolio standards uh, that, as I will uh, convince you of in a moment, do play a critical role at the moment and if we're trying to explain uh, the rate at which solar is being deployed. Um, at the same time, uh, people have studied, and this is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, works out sort of very cleanly in the studies over 30 years, have shown that uh, the costs and the prices of uh, solar cells have really come down at a very consistent rate. In fact, for uh, those of you who sort of have studied about the whole subject of learning by doing and learning curves in other industries, um, the solar PV industry is just a perfect illustration of that, uh, and it has shown this very consistently over the last uh, 30 years, as I said. Uh, back to natural gas for a moment. Uh, when we talk about shale gas and the price development over the last couple of years, it's clear that prices are pretty much at historic lows. But if you take a longer horizon over, say, the last 10 years, we have seen pretty dramatic fluctuations anywhere between $3 and $12 per thousand cubic feet. Um, and for 2011, I'll take that as a benchmark when I plug in some numbers in a moment, uh, delivery prices have somewhere been in the range of five to six dollars. Okay. So how does this shape up from the perspective of an investor? You ask yourself, what do I want to invest in? Yes, I like renewables. Yes, it would be nice, but is this a sacrifice we're ready to make? How much of a sacrifice would it be? And so the one uh, cost metric that gets used a lot in this area, which I think uh, is actually a useful way to get an apples to apples comparison between different energy sources, is what's known as the levelized cost of electricity. And uh, you see there in my bullet point, I've given you a sort of a verbal definition. Think of it just in a, in a non-technical form as this is really the soup to nuts cost of a particular energy source in terms of what the investor needs to put in in a new facility, operating costs, and basically this life cycle cost is a way to say this is what you would have to get on average for one kilowatt hour so that everybody gets paid off, the government, your investors, your suppliers, everybody sort of breaks even in this. Okay? And perhaps one uh, element in this discussion here that's important you can sort of think of this conceptually as having two components, one being uh, on an annual basis, the operating costs that go into producing the electricity. That is significant for natural gas, but is, com is almost absent for solar. And then you have the second term in there in my little equation that is basically your cost of capacity and the role of taxes. So the last factor there is the so-called tax factor that takes tax 
uh, liabilities and also tax subsidies into consideration. And that part is the one that's entirely sort of shaping the economics over on the solar side. So it sort of splits once again across these two uh, energy sources in terms of which ones matter. So where are we today? If I take a snapshot, and this is based on some uh, recent work that just came out, uh, we conclude that if you look at this lens of this levelized cost of electricity, we would um, say that if you look at it from the perspective of a company that, say, has warehouse rooftops or office building rooftops and can install solar there, uh, sort of what you may call a commercial uh, scale user, if, if you compare what they would have to pay as an investor uh, against what they would have to pay if they buy electricity from the grid, they can already be there uh, in terms of cost competitiveness. But uh, important to notice, this is subject to some uh, really qualifiers. You do need a good location, like in the southwestern United States. Uh, the current federal tax subsidies that I mentioned a moment ago are crucial, and I'll come back to that in a moment. On the other hand, uh, when people sort of do these type of life cycle cost calculations, one thing that gets often also forgotten is that there is a natural synergy between the time of day that the electricity is the most valuable and the time that the solar panels are also firing the most. So that may actually give uh, the uh, solar cost a little bit of an additional boost in this. Okay. So that's, again, from the perspective if what you're comparing is, should I make this as an investment, as some of you may have done for on your own rooftops at home, or uh, uh, here I'm just looking at uh, commercial installations. The, uh, the one that's perhaps more important for the overall question, where are we going with these energy sources, is really at the utility scale uh, level. And there, uh, the conclusion is there is still a considerable gap. You see the numbers, if I have to pinpoint it, in the current environment, and there's a lot of assumptions baked in that we can discuss, about eight cents per kilowatt hour for solar PV, but only 5.7 or 5.8 cents for natural gas at this point. So that's a considerable uh, gap, and that's based on uh, what I call sort of the, the most recent average prices, delivery prices in the US. Okay. So why is that important? Well, we're seeing, um, uh, after all, utility scale plants going up in the southwestern United States at this point. Why is anybody doing that? I think the plug variable ultimately that explains this uh, is uh, the local, that is the renewable fuel standards, uh, that are providing additional incentives uh, for people to make these types of investments. What the federal government is doing at this point by itself wouldn't explain it. Um, perhaps to go back to this point of how important is it what uh, the federal government is doing, if you do the numbers and you recall sort of my little split there in terms of thinking about this life cycle cost, the combination of the investment tax credit and uh, the accelerated write-offs really move the needle very considerably. If you were to take that away and that decision is going to come up for Congress in 2016, your uh, cost, your life cycle cost, would go up by about 75%. So that would really move the needle very considerably and something that uh, needs to be kept in mind uh, in the terms of the public policy discussion that's going, the U.S. is going to have in a couple of years. Okay? The other thing, just uh, like in real estate, when it comes to solar, the importance of location. This is nothing more than an insulation map that measures the effect of hours of sunshine in the United States. And you see, uh, if you go to uh, areas in the Pacific Northwest or parts of the East Coast, things drop off very, very quickly. Why is this important? Well, it's the whole notion of capacity. So here is a what I like to call sort of a spider chart that shows you sensitivities in terms of how quickly the cost of a solar installation changes as you change some of these uh, environmental factors. And the large, the blue line that is uh, coming from the northwest down to the southeast is the capacity factor uh, in this one. And that one, as you can see, has sort of the most dramatic effect. So from that perspective, locations like Germany, uh, which has been sort of one of the countries that has installed solar perhaps at the most rapid uh, pace in the last couple of decades, is really at a disadvantage that is uh, um, 
per persistent and to some extent also insurmountable. So the short here is um, solar in terms of deployment and economic viability, we probably also have to acknowledge it is going to be location specific, but not just the southwestern United States, but also other parts of the world. Let me compare this for a moment with the sensitivity of costs in natural gas. And there, once again, if you, if you sort of think about that life cycle a cost formula that I sort of tried to describe to you, the dominant thing to keep in mind is simply the price of the fuel, the price of the natural gas. That one here really moves the envelope the most. And if you had low prices, say, in, at, the, at the lower end of the range that we have seen over the last 10 years, say something in the range of $4 per 1,000 cubic uh, feet, uh, that would move my benchmark that I gave you a moment ago from 5.8 cents per kilowatt hour down to 4.5 cents. So then things would really get a lot tougher here for renewables and in particular for solar. Uh, let me in the remaining time sort of add a couple of rough projections. Carbon pricing and carbon regulations, of course, um, are the other thing that we think about that might change the equation and might change the underlying dynamics uh, in this race. Um, if the U.S. were to switch to um, natural gas and natural gas were to uh, substitute in for coal to the point that natural gas would account for 70 percent of power generation, uh, that would have considerable savings, and I think it came out of the numbers that we saw earlier, in the sense that it would uh, reduce carbon emissions by about 650 million tons, or about 30 percent of everything that we have from the uh, electricity sector. Uh, perhaps another thought experiment in all of this, what if the EPA were to go a step further and uh, take the perspective what they're doing with coal at the moment, they would also do with natural gas and say we grant licenses for new natural gas-fired power plants only if they have the capability to capture CO2. That seems to be technologically doable at this point. Our calculations sort of indicate that would make it just about competitive with solar in the current environment. That is, it would lift that cost from 5.8 cents to 8 cents, uh, 8.2 cents, as you see there. Um, and finally, if we, instead of regulations, think about prices as uh, the driver in these types of adoptions, um, our projections sort of indicate that a price of about $60 per ton for CO2 would, in the current environment, really lead to cost parity between solar and natural gas. And if you look at this also the other way around, providing incentives to fossil fuel, in particular natural gas manufacturer, uh, uh, power plant producers, to adopt CCS, $60 is about the, the price that would be required for those companies, for those investors to have an incentive to uh, deploy carbon capture capabilities. So I'm supposed to connect the dots. I've given you a lot of different dots. Let me also try to connect a few of those. Uh, bottom line is at the retail level, if you look at retail electricity prices, um, solar is already there in the current environment, uh, at least uh, when it comes to uh, the perspective of what you're paying off the grid in certain parts of the country, like, say, um, Southern California, where electricity prices tend to be relatively high. Uh, there is still a 35% gap at the moment in terms of uh, the comparison between utility scale uh, photovoltaics and uh, the life cycle cost of natural gas. Um, but keep in mind the learning curve that I mentioned several times earlier. If um, the solar industry can maintain that pace of learning that it has shown now over 30 years consistently, if it can maintain that for another 10 years, um, then the numbers also would suggest that at that point, solar really may catch up uh, in terms of cost competitiveness, even if then the federal subsidies went away. So in the public policy discussion, I'm sure one of the arguments is going to be made, do renewables need um, these types of subsidies forever? Um, my tea leaf reading or my crystal ball suggests no, you may want to keep it in place for another 10 years or so, uh, because the industry needs the volume to come down the learning curve. But if the trends that we have seen hold up 
it doesn't need the subsidies forever. It really uh, is uh, uh, on a limited um, uh, horizon for that, okay? Um, on the other hand, moving the needle back one more time or connecting the dot in the different direction, um, of course, it would move the goalposts a lot if shale gas uh, leads to natural gas prices that are at the lower end of what we have seen over the last 10 years. Uh, then that catching up that I just talked about would take considerably uh, longer. And I guess with the last point here, I'm preaching to the choir when I say in all of these public policy types of discussions, uh, from my perspective, taxation of CO2 emissions would be vastly preferable to continue tax subsidies, uh, which in my mind lead to greater distortions at the end of the day, even though they get us uh, towards the goal that we have in mind in terms of uh, lower carbon footprint for the United States. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Elton Sherwin, Carbon Zero. Um, in your case where you removed the uh, subsidies from solar, uh, we often read in the press that the oil and gas industry gets more subsidies than the solar industry, mm -hmm. although one assumes that's spread over a wider base. Did you also remove the tax incentives from the drillers and attempt to do a true apples-to-apples -apples comparison of removing <clears throat> the tax effect? Yes, uh, so that's a, that's a good point. The, the short answer is in uh, the numbers that we have run, we have not. Uh, other people have tried to do that. Uh, I mean, there are tax subsidies in particular, say, for at the uh, uh, drilling and exploration stage. Uh, but my uh, reading of that is these are not that significant. So uh, you're right, that should be taken into account. But uh, in terms of um, orders of magnitude, it's not that significant. Um, yeah, go ahead there. Um, yes, I think that next to the last bullet on your last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have the next talk loaded up, so unfortunately right, I can't go right. back to it. I remember yep. it. It's about moving the gas, cheaper gas moving the goalposts, which is my point on the last talk also. Mm -hmm. uh, the, last, the last speaker made the point that uh, all this gas is going to give us more time for the rest to catch up, and what you're saying is that's going to make it harder for the alternatives to catch up by making it cheaper. So it's like, it's enabling our addiction by having that gas cheaper. So maybe it's not so good to have that cheaper gas. Uh, yes, in terms of, there is the, the immediate benefit to the economy in terms of energy production. But uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the competitiveness of uh, the renewables, it's definitely going to make it harder. And it may then, uh, if again, uh, you, you believe renewables will over time become more cost effective, it's going to take longer, and um, the public, uh, in terms of the public subsidies and the tax code, would have to have more patience with renewables in order to affect it. Uh, right Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, particularly as thin, fil thin films develop a little further, if the cost related to distribution might change as something solar might be distributed more throughout heavy use urban environments, if you think that would kind of be at the level that it would impact the overall cost? Yeah. I mean, I actually had thin film on one of my slides briefly, and I think that's sort of an important uh, point in this, uh, or an important thing to keep in mind in this discussion. When I talked about this learning curve and what solar has shown over the last 30 years, this, has, this history has really been largely for silicon-based uh, solar. And uh, for thin film, we have a much shorter history, uh, but I think many of uh, the industry observers believe uh, thin film holds really the potential uh, for a breakthrough. So to some extent, there is in all of this an option in, in this to really have a game changer. Um, to some extent, my projections were much more conservative in just sort of extrapolating that the uh, crystalline silicon industry or, or manufacturing area can sort of hold on to the trend that it has shown in the past. Oh. Is there a microphone anywhere in you? Yeah, right here. <laughs> Uh, perhaps uh, this so one first. Uh, come there in a second, yeah. 
Uh, so definitely those prices are coming down. It's the learning curve that's great. I don't debate that at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. But it seems as though the uh, non-solar panel costs uh, aren't coming down nearly as fast because that's a lot of regular construction and labor stuff. Yes. How, how do those portions relate? Okay. So uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to sort of... Um, show you a little bit more of the details of these calculations, absolutely. Uh, it is the panel costs that have been coming down at a very rapid pace. Um, the balance of systems cost, uh, everything related to the cabling, inverters, and the like, at a much slower rate. And so the numbers that I gave you and the projection that if everything else had held steady on natural gas, we would be catching up in 10 years, assumes a slower rate of growth for the balance of systems. But still, those have been coming down as well, but not nearly at the same rate as you indicated. Thank you. Do we have time for one more, yes, or should I we? Take your last question, please. Last question, OK. Uh, assuming we don't get a breakthrough in bulk energy storage that would allow us to deal with intermittent solar, which we don't, I don't think we have yet. We're not yes. really close to it. What's your assumption about the need to back um, solar with gas plants, and that has to be costed out as well. Mm -hmm. Have you included those costs in your calculation? It, no, we have not. So the current numbers really, uh, to some extent, take advantage of the fact that renewables are really just a marginal uh, energy source and do not yet uh, sort of pose from a grid management and a grid stability uh, perspective the need to bundle it with either another power source that can come in very quickly or the possibility of storage. And I think as renewables expand uh, their relative share, that will become sort of the next thing to do uh, in this. But uh, I mean, perhaps here, this is the good news of the renewables still being relatively small. At this point, the issue is not that pressing, but I fully agree with you that it will become increasingly pressing uh, as that share expands. Okay. Very good, thank you.